Here at Metro East, local schools, nonprofits, and governments rely on us as an essential service provider and partner. With the onset of the pandemic, we've had to creatively adapt our services to support our community partners. On this segment of Community Hotline, we'll talk to Metro East Head of Production and Deputy Director John Lugton about some of the new and innovative productions we've been working on since the onset of COVID. With us today is the Deputy Director and Head of Production at Metro East Community Media, John Lugton. Thanks for being here, John. Thanks for having me, Monica. You're welcome. Um, so I wanted to get right into it by talking about a, a video that you recently made, uh, you and your production team, about the right of way. I understand your team won a national award from NATOA for that particular video. Yeah, that's absolutely, absolutely right. It's very exciting. Um, we haven't won that many NATOAs in the past, um, but winning one is just an amazing honor because it is at the national level. Um, the right away video we've made in partnership with the Office for Community Technology. Um, they're part of the city of Portland. And the video is really about explaining the public right of way. And I say public because you know, we actually own the right of way and therefore like the city of Portland is managing it on our behalf. So when people want to put utilities into the right of way, they have to be in negotiation with the city and therefore they're paying a fee to use the right of way. And that money is really, really valuable, not only to us as a community media center, but actually to the city of Portland, city of Gresham, Troutdale, Wood Village, Fairview, you name it. All right. So, so this explains, so the video explains it. How, how does that tie into Metro East Community Media? Why is that relevant to us? Well, the Office for Community Technology are a big part of our work through their association with the MHCRC. And um, they have a really big um, initiative, uh, digital equity and inclusion. And as you know, because we're out here in East County and have a couple of the most diverse zip codes in the whole state. Um, we have been able to work with partners and go in to do things like our introduction um, to computers class. And we're also a big part of what the Office for uh, Community Technology does, or OCT, is the broadband incentives to make sure as many people can be digitally connected as is possible. And we all know I mean, how vital that is. I mean, you can't apply for a job literally without being having the internet or anything like that. March of last year when, when COVID happened and the urgency of, you know, getting technology, getting online, da, 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 it, was, it was so present. And yeah, okay. you're right. We were able to, to be there and meet some of those challenges. If people want to see the, the uh, full video, it, it is available on our website, but I think we can show a little, uh, little snippet of it now. That'd be great. Access to communications technology has never been more vital, especially for our residents who are experiencing economic instability. Through the Broadband and Digital Equity Program, OCT collaborates with businesses, nonprofits, schools, the library system, and the county to make computers and broadband service available to everyone, especially our most vulnerable populations and those who have suffered the effects of systemic racism to ensure that everyone benefits from access to the internet. So on one of the things where you talked about was COVID and how that affected you know, our industry and everyone else. Uh, how, how did Metro East handle that? What, what, uh, what did you do differently to deal with COVID when, you know, when it hit our, our community? That is just an incredible question. Um, just to put it into perspective, you know, we cover probably in excess of 200 government meetings a year. That's a lot. So, that's a lot. Yeah. So that's nearly two thirds of our evenings are spent covering government meetings, but we were able to move really, really quickly. Um, we just suddenly were able to work it out. And we, you know, our team, Keith, Lauren, they jumped in, they worked out a technology solution that basically enabled us to take the stream that we were getting. Now, you've got to remember, March of last year, Zoom was a completely new thing for many people. And we managed to latch onto that. I don't believe we lost any meetings. We just kept going forward. There was no interruption to service. And what was more important about that was there was a lot of decisions that were getting made at the local level about how people were responding to COVID in our communities. 
that was really vital for us to be able to keep on people's radar. And having that channel that's dedicated to, the, to, to basically just municipal government is just a fantastic opportunity to folks for folks to see what's going on in their own backyard. And, uh, and that's really important. That's, uh, you know, civic engagement is huge. And for us to be able to keep that going was really, really important. What other kinds of things uh, do we do at Metro East that, that were impacted by COVID and that you had to make a change? Well, a real good fun story, um, again, from the early days, um, when it was the wild west of Zoom, um, was we partner um, with the League of Women Voters um, of Portland to provide, you know, um, election coverage. And of course, we had a we had a primary election going on. We ended up doing something like sixty-five Zoom interviews within like a month of of COVID having happened. In many instances, this was the candidate's only opportunity to do anything for the public. And we had an incredible uh, viewership on those. And we worked really hard on the channels, again, to make sure that you could see these interviews, you knew which candidate was coming up next. So we did lots of things to try and enhance the viewing experience so as as many people as possible um, could see these interviews. Uh, so people were engaged and they were connected. There are, uh, you work a lot with nonprofits as well, correct? So how, how do you work with them and how, how did that change? I know you've done videos, a lot of videos in the past for nonprofits. What kinds of things did you do for them at, during COVID? Well, during COVID, essentially to begin with, you know, it was just one cancellation after another. But then, you know, I think we regrouped really quickly. Um, and I think they started to think differently. And after a couple of weeks, we reached out to a lot of our regular clients and just let them know that we were there and let them know that we were still going to try and make video, um, but it might be slightly different. Yeah. And then we had worked on a project with Oregon Ask, who had wanted to work with another group called My Voice Music. And then we got a call from My Voice Music, kind of like, could you do a virtual fundraiser? We were kind of like virtual fundraisers. <laughs> Who's never that? heard of that? <laughs> yeah, and all of a sudden, we were kind of in this world of like, well, we have a 1600 square foot studio and it's really just producing a television show, but we stream it. And so it was more, I mean, the, the actual show completely in our, our basket, completely something we can do. The streaming is a whole other, whole other avenue. Um, it went really well. It was very successful. We learned a lot. Um, and they've come back several times since. Um, we worked with um, several other organizations, Elevate Oregon. We worked with them, did their fund fundraiser, Restore Oregon, Metropolitan Youth Symphony, my, my fa father's house. I mean, we, we worked with a bunch of groups. And what is really amazing is you get to form this relationship with them. You get to find out about their community. And you really get to see what they're out there doing. And at a stage, yeah, we're all wearing masks and we're all smelling a hand sanitizer. But you know what? We we kind of came together in the, in the common good of like, you know, they need to do a fundraiser. We also build community. I mean, we are, you know, we're not just about video. Yeah, it's something we excel at, but that brings us all together. I mean, it brings us together as a staff. I mean, it brings us together with everybody we work with. People, members of the public come in and take our classes to do all this amazing stuff. But really what we're doing underneath is we're building this incredible community. You only need to look at the range of programming that you see on our channels to realize, we're, you know, it's like, whoa, there's a lot of different perspectives out there. But we're there managing to get a lot of those on the channels, which is fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's about free speech and you're, you know, people getting their voices heard and, and we're giving people a, a platform to do that that otherwise they would not have. The work we're doing is so based in our community, mm -hmm. so based in the people that we believe we should be serving. And I really think that that's where we kind of elevate ourselves amongst those organizations across the country is because you know, we're really proud of what we do. And, you know, you only need to go and meet some of our, our folks who've learned to use a computer for the first time and you just get that goosebumpy glow going where you're just like, yeah, this, this, this is why I do this job. I'd say 
if people have any question about whether or not they should support community media, I think listening to you talk about it, they, they get a good feel for what we're doing and, and it is important. It's, it's something that we would all miss dearly if we did not have that. Absolutely. Thanks so much for your time today, John. I appreciate it. Thank you, Monica. Uh, and thanks to our viewers for watching today. Do check out our website and find out more about community media. I'm Monica Weitzel. Until next time.